Software gives us new ways of communicating with each other. Engineers build scalable systems for e-commerce, help desk, and video sharing. And these systems do scale to millions of people. But software alone cannot serve all the demands of all of the users and customers on these platforms. We need customer service representatives to address unexpected demands. We need design specialists to evaluate the interface that made sense to the engineers but not to the users. We need salespeople to connect our strange new software to an impatient, prospective customer. Engineers sometimes joke about firing all the non-engineers in the company. As engineers, it's easy to discount all of the work that non-engineers do. It can seem unscalable or non-quantifiable or mechanical. But most companies would fall over immediately without support, sales, design, operations, and the multitude of other non-engineering roles. More to the point, people in non-technical roles can drive the success of an organization. Some of the most influential leaders in tech came from a non-technical background. Stuart Butterfield of Slack, Brian Chesky of Airbnb, Sheryl Sandberg of Google and Facebook. A liberal arts education can foster the perfect set of skills to thrive in a modern technology company. George Anders is an author whose most recent book is called You Can Do Anything, The Surprising Power of a Useless Liberal Arts Education, useless in quotes, sarcastically. George is one of my favorite business writers, and some of his past writing includes pieces about Sequoia Capital, Amazon, LinkedIn, and a ton of other topics that he's written about on Quora. And if you like this episode, we've done many other shows about business with authors like Seth Godin and Tyler Cowen. Many of the shows on Software Engineering Daily are actually not deeply technical, but I know it can be hard to find the old episodes, and that's why we are building out an app ecosystem. The Software Engineering Daily app is available on iOS right now. You can download it and listen to all of our old episodes. You can easily discover the new topics that might interest you. You can upvote the episodes that you like. You can get recommendations based on your listening history. And if you're interested in contributing to the Software Engineering Daily app world, we've got an Android app under development, we've got a web front end, and we've got a back-end recommendation system. So no matter what kind of software you're interested in building, you can go to github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily and find out how to contribute. We hope that you will enjoy these applications that we're building and they give you a better Software Engineering Daily experience. So with that, let's get on to this episode. You have a software project that you want to build. Everybody does. I love building products, but I know more about how software fits together than how to actually write the code itself. I don't spend a lot of time writing code, but I do like to build software. That's why I use TopTal. TopTal is the best place to find reasonably priced, extremely talented software engineers to build your projects from scratch. You can get a pair of Apple AirPods when you use toptal.com slash SEDaily to work with an engineer for at least 20 hours, and I recommend it. I think it's a great way to build your projects if you don't have time to build them yourself. There's a misconception that engineers have to build all of their own projects just because they're capable of doing that. It's not true. TopTal has only the top 3% of developers. They turn away 97% of the developers that apply to work on the TopTal platform, and that's how you get a matching process that's unlike anything else I've seen in the freelancer marketplace. And I've tried a lot of different freelancing platforms. TopTal has such high-quality engineers, and they listen through the design specifications that you have. They handpick the perfect developer for your project, and this has saved me countless hours in my development process. There's really nothing that compares to TopTal that I have seen. So you can get a free pair of Apple AirPods when you try TopTal at toptal.com slash SEDaily. Find an engineer that's going to help you build your side project and get your MVP off the ground. As long as you do at least 20 hours, you get those free Apple AirPods. 
And if you've already got a company that you're working on, you can also use TopTal to scale your team and get everything done faster and raise the bar for your engineering or get through that blocker that's preventing your company from getting to the next level. So check out toptal.com slash sedaily and find an engineer who will help your project succeed. George Anders is the author of You Can Do Anything, The Surprising Power of a Useless Liberal Arts Education. George, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. Thanks for the chance to be on the show. Yes, and the last time we spoke was when I was doing the Quora cast, which was about Quora writers. That was a couple years ago, probably three years ago, and we had a great conversation. We've been in touch since then, and in that last interview that we did, you know, a, a, an article that you had wrote, written recently at the time was about Sequoia venture capitalists, and Sequoia is this uh, hallowed venture capital firm, and it's led by Mike Moritz, who is this hale, tall, fit venture capitalist that doesn't it does not have any training in technology. And I think this is an interesting starting point for the discussion today because your book is all about how. Essentially, anybody can do anything. Anybody from any sort of background can do anything. The resources are there. They're available. If you went in a certain liberal arts direction, you can reorient yourself in a direction towards technology or towards the future that is not mutually exclusive with what you did in the past. And I, I again, I want to start with Mike Moritz because I think he's a great example of this. He studied history. He was a journalist for a while. He did get an MBA at one point. But then he became a legendary venture capitalist, and now he deeply understands technology. How does Mike Moritz illustrate some of the values of a liberal arts education? So first of all, he's tremendously well-read and continues to read a lot. And I think one of the arguments in favor of a liberal arts education assumes that the people who get it are lifelong learners, and that they learn quickly, and that by probing into all sorts of non-technical areas, they've developed a, a mental roadmap for how you get smart on a new subject. And no matter how strong you are technically, there's always something new. And in venture in particular, you're, you're looking entirely for something new. So that ability to ask the right questions, take in relevant information, pattern match can be very helpful. Uh, moving beyond the core technology, though, one of the most interesting conversations I've ever had with him involved the question of what's the difference between someone who is a visionary CEO, sort of the Steve Jobs of their generation, if you will, and then someone who's a total charlatan. And Mike's point, which was very insightful, is it's hard to tell the two apart at first, that a lot of the markers that indicate true genius can also be counterfeited. And simply the willingness to acknowledge that gets you in a better place than if you keep locking onto those markers unaware that you're going to have some false positives along the way. And then it also makes you very alert to the fact that if you've got someone who's checking all the boxes, you still need to do a separate exercise to figure out, is this the real deal? Or am I dealing with someone who can fake it incredibly well? So when you look at Sequoia's portfolio, they've had you know, some spectacular hits. They're early in Dropbox. They you know, go back to Cisco and Apple. They were in, in those companies. They were in Google and Yahoo. But they have not had any of the giant companies that go splat the ones that came with great hype and didn't live up. They've had investments that didn't work out, but they've avoided uh, at least as much as possible mm. the charlatans. And I'd contend that coming from that kind of background where you're attuned to the psychological and the social dimensions of investors, as well as just, you know, what, what does the schematic diagram look like, uh, probably shields you from a certain class of mistakes. Mm. Now, as interesting as Mike Morris is as an extreme example of this, that's not really the the thrust of of the book. I think the thrust is more that anybody can find some fit in the modern economy, even if they came from a liberal arts background, or perhaps they have an even greater chance in some cases for certain roles than technology-oriented people if they came from a liberal arts background. Explain the inspiration for this book, You Can Do Anything. So one of the things that struck me, especially if we're talking about how does true core tech fit into the arguments that I'm making, is that when you look at how companies are staffing up, there's a nucleus of engineers that are doing amazing things. 
but you can then surround it with a much larger group of people who are doing the business development, who are doing the design work, who are doing user experience, who are doing digital marketing. And when you look at who Facebook is hiring, uh, go through their careers page, and you'll see far more jobs that are non-technical than technical. Now, all of the non-technical jobs wouldn't exist if you didn't have people building a, a site that was addictively popular. But once you've got that, there's a lot of room for the people with psychology degrees who know how to talk to customers to come in and help build that out, or the people with anthropology degrees to get the user experience just right. I, I think it's no coincidence that the designer of the Facebook like button, which you know, has ended up being ridiculously popular, was a music major in college. Are you describing something new here, like the idea that the human touch is relevant to the construction of technology companies, or has this always been important? Have have the people at the top always known this? Are you just re-emphasizing something and publicizing it, or is this a new phenomenon? So these things come in cycles, and we can probably roll the clock back a few decades, and we can find a great deal of interest in getting the, the well-rounded person or the person with high social skills. And then it may well be that in the last 15, 20 years, we've had such incredible progress on the technical side that in particular, political leaders, educators have seen the success of the highest achieving STEM graduates and have extrapolated a good trend to the point of absurdity and have decided that there is no path but STEM. And the answer is STEM is a really good path for people who are going to succeed at it. But there's a limit to how many STEM jobs there can be. And one of the things I do in the book is analyze job growth over the last four or five years. And if you go from 2012 to 2016, we created about 10 million new jobs. And about 600,000 of them were in computer, software, and IT broadly defined. So that's great for the 6% of people who found work there. But the other 94% of people found work in non-technical areas. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for doing the book is to remind people that uh, let's spread the spotlight a bit so that we're mindful of some of the non-technical strengths that otherwise get overlooked. Hmm. You wrote a book previously about, um, I remember that I, when I read this book, you talked about the jagged resumes. What was, it, what was the name of that book again? So that was The Rare Find. came out the in rare 2011. Find. Exactly. So, you know, when I think about that book compared to, to You Can Do Anything, it's almost like two sides of the same coin. So when you think about the rare find, that's basically about why it pays to have a jagged resume or why it's at least not problematic to have a jagged resume. How you could think about you can do anything is this is the supply side. This is an acknowledgement of the fact that there are so many weird jobs today that are created by the weird marketplaces we've created with technology products. And there's so many different places where somebody with a jagged resume can slot in. Like you write about this guy, Joshua Sucher. Sucher, I think? How Sucher, you pronounce it? yes. Sucher. Joshua Sucher, yeah. who, uh, you know, he had a very unusual background, but it actually made him perfect to be, like, what a cu what was it, customer success lead at Etsy, I uh, think? User or, experience, or, but yes. So, uh, user experience. He's, he's got an anthropology degree, and he started out in college at Bard College, which is very much a liberal arts school with the classic anthro focus on faraway civilizations. And you know, with freshman year, they have people snip off fingernails and they talk about why fingernails attached to our <laughs> fingers are clean. And then when they're clippings, they're dirty. And I, I don't think there's any way you can build a career as a, a fingernail analyst. But he's got this training and then he rattles around for four or five years and he does IT tech support and he does a whole lot of other things. And what he realizes is he's uniquely good at listening to people and figuring out what their story is and what their values are and consoling them or guiding them in good places. And he's the UX guy who does 10 minutes of work with cables and two hours of just chatting with his, his clients. And he retools himself to become a user experience guy. So now he goes out and talks to all of the artists and crafts people that put stuff up for sale on Etsy and figures out, okay, why are they selling on Etsy? What do they want to accomplish? What got them into the world of art in particular? What are their dreams and aspirations and dreads? And it, it helps Etsy build a better site. So he's doing anthropology. He's just moved from the truly obscure world of analyzing fingernail clippings to analyzing people with business aspirations. So on, you know, that's an example of someone who's taking a non-technical background and still being very useful in 
building out a company. When you spoke initially about this being the other side of the coin, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because when I did the rare find, a lot of the feedback that I got from people was, well, this is a very interesting book, but what I really wanted to read was, how can I use this in my career? I, <laughs> only a few of us do hiring, and you know, it's, we're all creatures of self-interest when you get down to it. So I can take direction. I thought about it. And I go, you know what? That actually would be a better book to write, and let me get to work on it. And that's how we ended up with You Can Do Anything. I sell podcast ads, and podcast ads are a weird commodity. Many of my potential customers are not actively looking for podcast ads, so I have to reach out to them with a cold email. This cold email process is what lots of people go through, whether they're marketing a software product, a newsletter, or an online course. I know there are a lot of people who are listening to this who are building some kind of new software product, and they're trying to figure out how to sell it. If you're building your own business, you have to learn to sell, and if you're going to sell, you have to learn to prospect. Prospecting is the process of gathering email addresses and sending messages to potential customers. Prospect.io is my favorite tool for prospecting. You can find email addresses of people at any company. You can find email addresses of users on LinkedIn. After you find those emails, you can use Prospect.io to manage your prospects and to send emails. You can see when somebody opens your prospecting email, and you can stop sending those emails when they have signaled that they're not interested. If you're building a product, you have to find customers to sell to. How do you find customers? By prospecting. I've tried a ton of prospecting tools. Prospect.io is my favorite. Prospect.io is offering Software Engineering Daily listeners 20% off your first two months. Just mention SE Daily to Prospect.io support after you sign up. And if you're selling something, try out Prospect.io. I hope you enjoy it. Now, there's certainly like the supply side and demand side discussion of people with jagged resumes being able to find uh, strange jobs that they are a good fit for. But, you know, you're talking about Joshua Sucher as being a master listener. I mean, everybody can benefit from being a master listener. So, you know, part of this I think about is there's an element of actually there are certain skills or traits that regardless of who you are or where you've come from, if you're entering any sort of workplace, there are principles of human nature and skills that you can learn that are going to be relevant to you. And I think of like being a master listener as one of them. And I, I would almost say that Joshua Sutra could have come from literally any background. And as long as he would have been a master listener, he probably would have been a pretty good fit for this type of job. So as an example of a skill, of a, of a generalizable skill, why is listening so difficult to master? And what are some other core skills that anybody could learn regardless of where they're coming from and, and what job they're entering? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought up listening because when you look closely, listening's a lot harder than it seems. And the first reason that it's hard is because it requires us to shut up that we can't interject into the conversation, we can't tell our own very excellent stories, we can't even interrupt to affirm what the other person is saying. We need to give them room to be themselves. And that's difficult. I and mean, we all have a desire to jump back in the conversation and sometimes even to take command of it. And when we're talking, we can't be taking in input from other people, which defeats the whole purpose. Uh, the second reason listening is hard is because you're not just paying attention to the words that people are saying, but you're paying a great deal of attention to how they're saying them. So this can be as simple as body language. Are people confident? Are they defensive? Uh, you want to pay attention to what people aren't saying. That uh, Lyndon Johnson had a famous observation that any time a, a constituent or another senator would come into his office, he always knew there was one thing that they had to tell him and one thing that they were terrified of telling him. And his job sometimes was to get them to talk long enough to get to the second one. So um, it's, it's an art to, to draw people out, to be attentive to the tone of their voice, the, the cadence. And you're really taking in a lot of information. You are your own 
you know, machine learning system keying off of all these different elements and trying to build it into a model of what's going on in this person's head. You describe the new jobs that are being created. Maybe we should discuss a little bit more about these new jobs, what you're referring to there. But you describe them as being unified by, quote, an explorer's spirit. What do you mean by that explorer's spirit? And what are some of these new jobs that you're talking about? So let me give you a little bit of context, and then we'll get rolling into some examples. You and your uh, all of our listeners may have encountered the famous 10,000-hour rule, which grew out of some psychology research at Florida State and then got popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, the New Yorker author. And the contention on this is you need 10,000 hours to master a field before you're really good at it. And most of the original research comes out of classical music. And if you want to be the best violinist or the best pianist you can be, you've got to outdo whatever Horowitz and Mahuddin and all of the the other Rubenstein great talents of, of days gone by did. That's tough. And when I talk about the explorer's spirit, I'm encouraging people to look for fields that no one else has done before. So we had the example of you know Facebook's early designer who shows up as a music major and he's got some ideas of how to make the site look nice. And this is in 2005 when Facebook is a tiny business. He does not have 10,000 hours of experience as a digital designer, but he showed up at a place that's creating a whole new rule book and you can be doing amazing work just a few thousand hours into it or a few hundred hours into it. So when I say explorer spirit, I'm really encouraging people to get to areas that are new enough that the, the norms haven't been defined yet. There's room to do it your way, and there's a good chance that you will do it better than anyone else has done before because actually no one else has done this before. And now let me give you a couple examples of what we're talking about. So I looked at Bureau of Labor Statistics data for the book Uh, If you go back 10 or 15 years ago, fundraising was not a category. I mean, there might be someone at the Metropolitan Opera who did fundraising and someone at the De Young Museum who did fundraising, but there were not a lot of people doing that full time. And now that we've got Kickstarter, we've got Razor's Edge, we've got all sorts of uh, software-driven tools that make it much easier to keep track of donors, a lot more organizations can put someone in charge of fundraising without having such high costs that it's undoable. And what do you need to be good at fundraising? You need to understand the dreams and aspirations of the person who could be your donor. And the technical part gets taken care of by software, but what remains is the human piece, uh, trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to connect with this person? What are we going to establish that'll make them want to write us a check and feel proud of doing so? So that's one example. Uh, Another example that I go into the book is the rise of market research. And again, you know, you look at how many SurveyMonkey and Qualtrics surveys there are out there, and you could fill out surveys every day for the rest of your life. And even if we don't fill out many of them, we fill out enough to keep a lot of people busy trying to figure out how do I design good questions? What do we want to know? How do I interpret the data? So another field that's growing very rapidly. Uh, I already talked about design. I talked about user experience. Uh, project management is another area that I look at. And the traditional project manager is you know, building out a factory or a bridge or something. And now uh, the tech sector is providing an enormous amount of work in project management. And some of the people who are doing it end up having non-technical degrees because a lot of what they need to do is unify all of the people with subject specialties and get them moving in the same direction. And it turns out that being a psychology major or a sociology major or a political science major is not a bad prep ground to be able to do that. This is somewhat tangential to the idea of people being able to use their liberal arts educations for uh, new jobs, but there's also the repurposing of jobs that are like white collar jobs that are somewhat on the on the, the the threat horizon of being automated, like accounting. So, for example, I talked to this company Flowcast, and they make close management software. So, if you're if you have a business that does lots of invoicing and you need to be able to close those invoices out, that is an entire management process in and of itself once your company becomes big enough. So they you know, they make this software, and it's like a venture-backed company, and it's like very difficult software to write. And the people that they hire to do the product management are accountants, like ex-accountants that didn't really like doing accounting, or you know, maybe they didn't like the, the salaries that they were getting, or they didn't like the type of work. 
uh, and so they find themselves in a, uh, in project management roles or in by the way in customer service roles you know and and they they are extremely well paid customer service people because they're doing customer service on accounts that are uh, quite you know quite valuable and I think that's you know that's representative of just a broader trend of you know people who are domain experts in whatever field uh, there is some technology that's disrupting that field and disrupting doesn't mean immolating all of the jobs that exist in that field it means in some cases replacing them with technology infused versions of the past instantiation of those jobs that is a really nice argument and I, I can parallel it in some other areas that if you look at how recruiting was done 20 years ago people had in some cases literal card files of all their contacts and being able to build up a list of potential people in the industry and connectors was part of the skill and now we've brought in LinkedIn, which automates a great deal of that. I mean, with 15 minutes of search, you can come up with more names than anyone with a card file can. But we have not made recruiters obsolete, even though probably some of our listeners wish there were fewer of them and that they didn't send so many emails. But be that as it may, uh, the successful recruiters are able to bring a human dimension to it, just as you described with uh, the former accountants who go into high-end customer service. And being able to explain the job clearly, see reasons why you might be a good fit for it, set up that first meeting where it's discussed. A good recruiter will approach the right people with the right propositions and be pretty successful. And that's worth a whole lot more than a not-so-competent recruiter that's clumsy in their approaches and targeting poorly. So we use technology as a substrate, but on top of that, we add a lot of human skills and uh, technology changes the job, but it doesn't obliterate jobs. There is some degree to which these economic changes are a Rorschach test, and I, you know, like there's, you know, I have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley who I can talk to about the the changing economy. They're super optimistic about it. They're genuinely optimistic, not just optimistic in the sense that like I'm a technologist in Silicon Valley and I'm gonna make a bunch of money off of these economic changes. It's more like they see this as inspiring and they see it as an opportunity to build new ways of doing business and creativity and whatnot. There are other people I know who tend to be outside of Silicon Valley who see this as a zero-sum game where things are getting automated and these are destroying jobs and it's it's actually limiting creativity in some cases or limiting creative jobs. In your travels and in your discussions with people while writing this book, what kinds of pushback or skepticism did you hear? So it's interesting that you mentioned the zero-sum content uh, co construct, because when I, I think about areas that are most alarmed by change, uh, we're also seeing a real slowdown in Americans willing to, well, American willingness to migrate, to put it all in a U-Haul or a moving van and go to a new place. And if you think about how our country has handled technological change in previous generations, Yet a lot of people move out of you know, the Oklahoma Dust Bowl to come to California because there were better jobs. Yet a huge number of people leave the rural South uh, after World War II and come up to Detroit and Chicago and uh, other northern industrial cities to work in factories because the jobs were better and the future was better. And I think that the zero-sum argument gets intensified when people are apprehensive about trying their luck in a new place. And if you look at mobility statistics, the number of people in America that move from one state to another is about half of what it was 30 or 40 years ago. So yes, if we want to stay in communities where the traditional employer is disappearing and somehow hope that a new employer magically emerges, that's going to be hard. But if people are willing to say, I want to try my luck somewhere else, then uh, opportunities are better. So you know, when we talk about establishing basic income, that may or may not be a good idea. But I think giving people moving vouchers to, to relocate somewhere else could solve a lot of problems or at mm. least open up a lot of opportunities. Well, that's a creative suggestion I haven't heard. Moving vouchers? Is there is there somebody who's written at length about that? Uh, really not yet. I mean, you're, you're catching an embryonic idea and you know, give me two or three months to do <laughs> deeper work on this and I will either really like the idea or you'll never hear of it again. But uh, huh. you know, as I look at some of the, the elements in play, uh, we could also get into the question of did we encourage too many people to buy their own homes? Because once you own a home, you have much less mobility and you've got to sell it and a lot of oh. homes are underwater. So one of the many darker consequences of the whole mortgage lending boom of 
2005 to 2007 is we may have taken a lot of people out of rental homes that worked pretty well for them and put them in home ownership that was really deleterious both to their, uh, their financial health and their ability to uh, repot their careers. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to pull on that thread further, but if you've got something, I, I would we'll love to hear to it. it. You know, I, I hope to be a guest every two or three years okay. on the show. And okay. Ne- All ne- right. Next That's time, you know, g- give me a little time. We'll get there. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. We'll get there eventually. You know, so, okay. But let's take another example of like dramatic change that is occurring that both perhaps destroys certain jobs and creates others. So just as an example, the massive migration from paper and filing cabinets to all digital. So for example, I think about my dad working as a family practice doctor. You know, growing up, he would always come home with basically like a, a refrigerator's like the the amount of volume that would fit in a refrigerator he would come home with that much paperwork every night it was just like folders and folders and folders of of files and there was an entire fleet of people who worked at his office you know who who kind of did all the paperwork for all the different doctors or managed all the filing cabinets and that's all going digital so when you think about that as an example of paper going to digital you know what's the account what's the accounting there what is gained and what is lost in terms of jobs or efficiency so overall i think it's a net positive and probably a pretty big positive that we have much more rapid access to things and i when i wrote my first book i was still in the filing cabinet era and i would have times where i'd spend an hour and a half trying to find something that i knew was somewhere and i didn't know where and even if I knew it was somewhere inside a 200-page SEC filing, that was a lot of pages to turn forward and backward. And on my worst days, I'd get stuck where I'd start one of those projects and then I'd find something else. And pretty soon I was in the midst of six really clumsy sorts of searches. And the minute hand was moving round and round on the clock and the hour hand was starting to circle too. And I'd go, that was a really unproductive day. <laughs> and now, you know, you've, you've got instant searching and you put in a few keywords and you've got the document you want within a matter of seconds. So that is a tremendous boon. Now you stop and say, okay, what's the, the catch on this? Um, I think there's something that we process differently in information when it's tactile and it's in front of us. So our ability to take in the whole picture to, you know, I I still have images long ago of putting everything on the carpet and just kind of spreading it in front of me across Mm -hmm. 10 feet like a, you know, a kindergartner. And sometimes when you're trying to fit a lot of pieces together, that's great. Uh, I can't tile my computer to approximate that. I've tried it a couple of times and there's something about you just don't take it all in the same way. So uh, it's helped us moving from, Paper to digital has helped us tremendously on the micro pieces of our jobs. We do them faster. I think on that macro overview sense, there's something about whether it's the way our vision works or our neural processing that having it big and tangible um, can help us find the big ideas a little faster. You know, I, I would love to talk about your technique for writing a book because you know, it sounds like you have some elements of that process that are digital and other elements that are tactile in nature. Uh, this is kind of getting off the topic of your of your book itself, but certainly on the topic of economic change, how are how are how is the process of authoring a book changing? That's a relevant topic. So how what is your current modern technique for writing books? So I'm still using Word uh, to do the bulk of my stuff and then just creating a lot of documents and then I'll do a sort of project management spreadsheet in Excel and I color it up with different colors depending on how much I've got done. So that's marvelous in terms of keeping track of what I'm doing. And everything starts out as red when I've done absolutely nothing on that chapter. And then I've got like four different measures and it turns to orange when I'm at least starting to stir and yellow when it's not hopeless and light green when it's getting good. And then finally, it's this beautiful you know, dark forest green. And I, it's this sort of visual reinforcement. And I spend six months trying to turn red to green. And when the alchemy is done, I have a book. There are special pure play writing software programs that I have I keep meaning to use. And the problem is every time I embark on a full length book, I'm scared of letting go of all my work habits. So what I need to do is start on an ebook that's meant to be 30 pages. And you can't get too lost doing an ebook, and very worst case, if it just 
totally fails, then it's, it's not like you, you feel a major part of your life was ruined. So at some point, I'll transition and I'll pick an ebook that'll exist as much to teach me how to use the next generation of software as anything. But I do find staying organized is every bit as important as the research piece and the writing piece. And on short material, blog posts, even magazine articles, I can go pretty directly from my research notes to at least the first pass of the written draft. And in a book, you just can't. You sort of have to create this intermediate product that's sort of both an outline and then partly milled and partly refined notes so that you begin to know what's going to go where. And how I create that intermediate stuff changes book by book and sometimes even chapter by chapter. But I I need to leave room to have something that's going to be my staging area where I can get all the material in a format that's organized to become a chapter as opposed to mm. raw transcripts of interviews that aren't organized to be anything. Uh, yeah, that spreadsheet process sounds fantastic. That sounds like you it, it really puts... I guess organization, it puts a framework around the process of writing a book. So what do, what do you think of long-form content today? Does, does long-form content have value? What's, the, what's the, the value proposition between a book or releasing what would be the contents of a book as a series of blog posts? Why not do that? I'm going to try and defend long form as long as I possibly can. And there are times where I think, you know, this, this makes perfect sense. And there are other times where I think I'm, I'm trying to preserve the MOA or the Dodo or something. And I just can't accept that, you know, evolution is passing it by. Uh, but, but let's give it a shot. So I think long form is a great way of building a whole new mental model for people. Uh, in short form, you, you make an argument, you provide your story, and you, you don't really embark on a, a ardent a crusade to, to change the way people think. I, we've been using both short form and long form for a long time. I mean, you go back to Thomas Paine and, you know, what was he doing? He was creating these pamphlets that were somewhere in between long form and short form. But, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe had to write Uncle Tom's Cabin as a full-fledged book to get people woken up to the horrors of slavery. And Abraham Lincoln referred to her as, you know, the woman who started the war. But, there's something about spending multiple hours with a book where you go, wow, the world's different than what I thought. Right. And I don't want us to lose that. And I think the reading habit is probably atrophied a little bit in the age of YouTube and podcasts and everything else. And that's good because we've got more ways of communicating. But uh, I'd like to think that people will continue to make time for that special book that will tell them something useful. And again, we come back to tactile, that the books have a a very literal heft to them. And uh, you'll find on the speaking circuit that just about everyone who shows up at a conference has a book. And it may be readable, it may not be readable, but it still validates that they have enough substance to have got it published as a book. If you want to start a podcast, check out Podsheets. Podsheets is a product we built to create and manage podcasts. We are podcasters ourselves, and we understand the difficulties of getting started. You have thought about starting a podcast, but there are so many questions. Is it expensive to get audio equipment? No, it's not. You can get a decent mic for $20, or you can get started with just an iPhone headset. Is it hard to get a good quality audio recording? It's actually easy. We will show you how to record your audio and get good fidelity. Okay. How do you edit an episode? We will teach you how to edit an episode or to help you find an editor who will edit your episode for $5 or $10 per episode. And then how do I post my episodes? How do other people get access to them? Podsheets makes it easy to post your episodes and distribute them to iTunes and Google Play with a single click. If you're curious about podcasting but have no idea where to start, Podsheets will guide you through the process. Podsheets is built by podcasters for podcasters. With Software Engineering Daily, we've been producing five shows a week for two years. We understand recording, we understand how to produce your show, and we understand how to get advertisers. We want to help you with this process. Check out Podsheets today. We will give you everything you need to create and manage your podcast. And if you have any questions or get confused, you can always contact us directly for help. Podcasting is as easy as blogging. 
let us show you how to podcast with Podsheets. Yeah, so I used to love reading books and it would shape my mind you know, over the course of those 300, 500 pages, or two, even just 200 or 100 pages, it would completely reshape how I thought about something or how I thought about the entire world in the case of those books that really just are inflection points in your life. And now I just read Twitter. <laughs> but Twitter, I feel like Twitter is reshaping my mind also. It, it, you know, in, in aggregate, Twitter almost feels like it has the velocity or the I don't know what the ad, the word is, but it changes me in a way that is of some the same momentum as as a book. Do, do you feel this is Twitter reshaping your mind, or I don't know how much work, how much time you spend um, on Twitter? More than I should, and you know, just so we can enlist a couple other people in our Twitter recovery circle, I'd done an interview with Stuart Butterfield, the founder of Slack, oh, and he's a philosophy yeah. major, and I'd asked him, "So, what are you reading?" And he gives me this more in full look and he says, Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, Twitter. it's corrupting all of us. And there's an immediacy to it that's very exciting. And I do end up clicking on a lot of links and I will end up reading stuff at length. And I, this morning it led me into Franklin Foer's lament of why the new republic isn't what it, he wanted it to be. And mm -hmm. it's taken me into other long form bits of writing. So I'm, I'm willing to sort of use Twitter as a... Um, a little launch cannon to get me back up into the, the higher parts of the atmosphere. Um, what can I say? I mean, there's something fascinating about seeing how consensus forms and arguments get defined. A lot of insight can be condensed into very short tweets. Uh, in fact, someone had made the point that Ralph Waldo Emerson was really Twitter before it became Twitter. And most of what he did was go on the speaking circuit and just speak in 140 character aphorisms. And then every now and then he'd glue them together into a book. So we've been dancing on the edge of you know, short form versus long form for a long time. But I'm not ready to let go of long form yet. I don't know whether that's a thought out position or that's just a primal emotional urge, but that's where I am. Well, me neither. I mean, I, I've changed to going through the vessel of an audio book. Uh, and I know you 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 read this book, right? You read this for your audio book, right? I, I did. It was my very first experience doing high quality audio recording, and the answer is there's a lot to learn from the pros, and I did my best to try and learn it as quickly as I could. <laughs> I hear it's exhausting. Wear wear cotton clothing. That's that's my one tip for anyone. That apparently, <laughs> if you wear stuff that's you know uh, blends or whatever, it's crinkly and it makes too much noise for the microphone. So, oh, wow. uh, if you've got that old cotton shirt that's starting to wear at the elbows. Hang on to it. That will be your audiobook recording shirt. Hmm. Uh, so, but Twitter, Twitter's another one of these things that's almost like a Rorschach test where some people, just like automation, will be like, well, this is, you know, this is kind of hurting the world. And other people will say, well, automation is, is giving people more time to do interesting things with their lives. Twitter is is, you know, a lot of people will be like, ah, you know, kind of mournful, like you said, with Stuart or with yourself, kind of mournfully saying, ah, this is not so good. And there does feel something naughty about it. It does feel like maybe this is some some low calorie. Or soylent. It's not really food. And yet we can ingest <laughs> yeah. it. And uh, yeah, you, 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 I'm, I'm willing to embrace Twitter. I, I refuse to go down the soylent route, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the same kind of uh, debate. Just to loop back to an earlier point you made, uh, Mike Moritz does not use Twitter. And hmm. this is partly because Sequoia was offered a chance to be in the B round at, I think, a 300 million valuation or something. And they said no, or they wanted it to be less and they couldn't negotiate it down. So in a way, he's sort of defending his investment decision. I, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth. He didn't literally say that. But uh, he's still a long form guy and he won't go Twitter. But a lot of us do. And it's, it's kind of fascinating seeing um, you know, how – even mainstream companies are realizing that this is an important place, not just to play defense, but to uh, to get their point of view across. I had Brad Stone on the show a while ago, and we talked about journalism because he's Bloomberg. I, he's, I think he's like head yes, of he is. He, he runs he head their of technology, technology team. Yes, he yeah, is. He, yes, he's, he's done well, and Brad's a friend and a very accomplished writer and reporter. I've got nothing but admiration for him. Me too. I feel exactly the same, and he's done. 
I mean, the Everything Store. What he the book his book about Amazon. I read that before and after I was at Amazon. I, you know, I, I spent eight months working at Amazon, and the book felt true beforehand and after. And I and I think that's a testament to how accurate he is in his reporting and how thorough he is. Um, one of the interesting conversations I had with him was around, like, I was kind of pausing to him. What like what do you need Bloomberg for? Like you're Brad Stone. Why don't you set up a Patreon account of Brad Stone's journalism or something like that? Like you know, or set up your own website. Like pay a developer five thousand dollars, make a website where you can donate to Brad Stone. You get Brad Stone content. Maybe you would capture more upside from that. You'd develop even more of a personal brand. And I'm I'm at, the reason I'm bringing this up around you is because you've written for a number of different high profile publications, but you also have you, similarly to Brad, you have developed a brand yourself as as an author of actual books. So I I don't know. I just love to get your thoughts on the current world of journalism. And I I think we had you know I I commented on something on LinkedIn recently where I was uh, also wanting to get your thoughts on this, but. What do you think about the, what are the trade-offs between building a personal brand as a journalist and building a brand while simultaneously giving a lot of leverage to the larger organization that you work for? I'm glad you asked about trade-offs because uh, I think there's there's some really interesting elements on both sides of the ledger. And the first thing is is journalism an individual exercise or a team exercise? And as much as we become known for our individual bylines, there's a whole ecosystem of people that will help us sharpen our ideas, that will bring things to our attention. And you can run some of that solo, but the I've been lucky to work inside a lot of great organizations. And in each one, I've had colleagues where I go, you know what, we're making each other sharper. And I think, in fact, on our, our LinkedIn exchange, you've made the point that if you really want to build out cloud, it's probably better to do it as part of Google Cloud than to become Jeff Meyerson Cloud or George Anders Cloud. Yeah. And there are some things where it's not just the mechanical economies of scale, it's sort of the the, the participation in a knowledge hive uh, that can sharpen you. And I, I was treated very nicely on this last book by Little Brown, which brought in excellent indexers and copy readers and legal review people. And those Oh my goodness, one scene where I described a, a guy whose resume includes doing crime scene analysis and uh, how that helps him get jobs. And uh, I had made reference to blood splatter. And my copy editor happened to be someone who doubles as an emergency room doctor. And she said, you mean blood spatter? There's no L in it. And I look it up and oh. she's right. And it's, it's one of these things I had no idea. But when you're in, in an ER doctor, you know that kind of stuff. And I didn't think, you know, I should have this book read by someone who's got emergency room medical experience because they'll be able to catch mistakes I, I made. But I got a free ride on that. And it's a tiny example, but it's indicative there's a lot of expertise you can get elsewhere. Uh, the other issue that's probably more ambiguous is traditionally become part of a big organization and you don't get as much of the economic rewards of your work, but you get a great deal of job security and you get the benefits of a promotion machine that will get your stuff to people. And when I started writing for the Wall Street Journal, there were presses that would print my story and delivery people that would load it up and you know they'd throw... 1.8 million papers on people's lawns. And I didn't have the energy to get trucks and drive around at three in the morning <laughs> and throw copies of my paper on people's lawns, and nor, nor could I have reached all of the lawns. So in that case, it was, it was incomparable. There was no other way I could get that level of distribution. Now, of course, we've got an ability, if you put up a post and it goes viral, the, the internet does all the work for you. You know, Whether it's Akamai or Comcast or Facebook or Google, you can decide what part of the internet ecosystem is making your distribution happen, but it's happening. So that's more tempting, but there's still the imprimatur of having been published by a place that has high standards, and that's a credibility check. It, it'll draw new readers in who you might not otherwise get if people weren't confident in your brand. Uh, it also keeps you honest. There's someone to, who reads your material and makes sure that you don't become a ill-informed crank with a lot of opinions and a and memo of work. But you know, maybe the answer is we straddle both worlds. There are times where we are our own brand and there are times where we're part of an organization. There are pluses and minuses each way. Hmm. 
Now, so another part of the conversation I had with Brad Stone was about Jeff Bezos and Amazon, and he so he had written, you know, he wrote the Everything Store, which is really one of my favorite books, certainly one of my favorite business books, and you know one of the things you get out of that book, and and if you've watched as many Bezos YouTube videos as I have and listened to a, to a lot of interviews with him, because just because I'm fascinated with the guy, he's just a really interesting guy. I remember there's this quote when somebody is talking about. Bezos, like, I think I think it's the um, the D. E. D. E. Shaw, Dave David David Shaw, the hedge fund guy who Bezos had worked for in his New York days. Yes, so he was saying of Jeff Bezos, this is one of the few people I've met who has a balanced left brain and right brain, and he I think he was referring to, in some sense, the technical side as well as the liberal arts side, and I'm not sure if people recognize that about Jeff Bezos. But I think that's one of the strengths that he has of you know his his ability to have these uh, short, pithy, but extremely effective statements about philosophy or about and this is what makes him so effective as as uh, the leader of the Washington Post as well because he he really understands narration he understands story as well as the technical side and the business side and i think you know we can think we can almost think of this as like a prime example the the most extreme example perhaps a mike moritz style example of why your book makes sense of why there is so much value in today's economy in having a liberal arts side i think that's the left brain or i don't know what you would say uh, it's what the are your thoughts of what you think right brain ends up being creativity left brain oh, ends up being engineering okay. yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> So what do you think about that? What makes these kinds of people so prolific that have both sides, the technical and the liberal arts side? I think we'd have to go all the way back to genetics and kindergarten to be able to figure out all of it. But it's I, I like the way you framed it, and I think that that ability to function in both worlds feeds on itself. I, I was struck reading the latest shareholder letter that Bezos does, and he's now taken on a little bit of the Warren Buffett. Uh, mantle of, I'm not just going to tell you how my lines of business did. I'm going to offer you some thoughts about what I think is good management and how American business should be making the most of its opportunities or you know, should stop doing stupid things. So this time he talked about what you can learn from focus groups and market research versus what you have to do on instinct. And the, uh, the condensed message is there's room for both. And if you strictly rely on what people are expecting, you'll miss the disruptive leaps into something new. And yes, once you've got the product out, you need to fine tune it and get your answers better. And the Amazon remains as customer obsessed as ever, but there's still room for that intuitive right brain style jump of, I just think people will like this if we give it a shot, or I think this is the next direction to go. So yeah, that ability to lead in both dimensions is unusual that there's seat of the pants people who claim to have great intuition, and sometimes they do, but they have a hard time handling data. And they're data people who wait for it to be in the numbers. And the risk is by the time that preference becomes clear, you're a year to 18 months behind the cycle because someone else had the courage to try it before the numbers came in. So when you take a person take a person who is who has a liberal arts background and they grew up wanting to write the great American novel, or um, they wanted to be a poet, or they want to be an artist, do you encourage them to find a career that that, uh, enables them to simultaneously build skills that can let them eventually achieve those sorts of things, that can maybe, like, let them build the skills to, to be to write the great American novel, or to be a great poet someday, or to be a great artist, be a great musician, or, or do you think of these as just more like, okay, you know, if you're inclined to be a poet, that must mean that you have certain skills and you should derive what those skills are. What are the more fundamental skills that might be applicable to the workplace? I don't know. Give give some thoughts on like, if if there's anybody out there who is a liberal arts major who is a wannabe poet, but needs to pay the bills and they're trying to find some middle ground between the two, how should they approach this economy? So the the first place I, I want to go on this, and it's a great topic, I encourage people, as we already discussed, to look for new forms of expression, new channels that are just taking shape. So I think there's actually a line in the book that says, it's going to be really hard to write the great American novel, but no one has yet created the great American infographic. And if you like to tell stories, mm. look and see what you can do in forums like that. Uh, that truck driving one was pretty good. The NPR truck driving one. You remember that one? 
Okay. Actually, reintroduce it for the, the audience so people have that for you. Uh, yes. So, and, and, and again, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This goes back to the difficulty of listening. Uh, but uh, the, the truck driving one is like, it just, it was an infographic that just showed the United States and showed the percentage of jobs in each state that is truck driving. And it gave people a cold sense of reality of how threatening self-driving trucks could be. Uh, n- nicely done. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it, sometimes you can get across points that way to a greater degree. In fact, I I had conversations with people at McKinsey and they go, you know, no one's reading our 200 page reports anymore. And our first thought was, well, what if we condense them down to 100 pages? And the answer is that doesn't really solve the problem. And now they've got an infographics team that's doing very clever stuff. So new forms of telling come up in the same way that new musical instruments do. And you could be the very best clavichord player in, you know, 1720 Vienna. But you probably ought to figure out the piano and you know the the high grade violin, and eventually you ought to get to know the saxophone and the electric guitar, as opposed to saying, "But I can play the clavichord." So, in coming back to the the broader reason we're going down this is, what do you do if you if you see yourself as a poet, and how do you make a living? Social media is opening up a tremendous number of opportunities for clever writers, and in fact, in the book, you can do anything. I share several stories of people who started out with English degrees and ended up becoming the the voice of Groupon with the, the right amount of sassiness or people who did social media campaigns for Viking ranges and how to make these, you know, giant 3000 BTU flamethrowers into something that would be fun to have in your kitchen. And there are a lot of opportunities to tell stories and show wit and develop characters within the new telling forms. So that's that's one direction to go. You didn't ask about this, but I'll I'll put down a marker on it anyway. I think the torment of the concept great American novel comes in the contradiction between the first two words, that a great novel has room to go wherever it wants to go, and an American novel, by definition, has to talk about the totality of America. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the attempts to get there try so hard to fit in all aspects of American culture that they end up reading a bit more like almanacs than novels, or else they become so narrow that they're great, but they're not deemed sufficiently American enough. So people have been struggling to write the great American novel since the concept was introduced in 1870, and no one's got a clear win yet. And I think it's because you can write a great novel or you can write an American novel, but you're, you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to do justice to both those concepts because they bang into each other. You are someone who has essentially done anything. I mean, if you if you look back in your career, you've you've checked a lot of boxes for somebody that wants to be a writer. Uh, you know, just think of them thinking of the, thinking of the goals of a writer. You could under that uh, purview, you could be a journalist, you could be an author, you could be a social media writer. You've kind of done all these things. You continue to do all of them. Like you said, somebody like yourself has all kinds of opportunities. You know, I think the the thrust of your book is not just that uh, a liberal arts education gives you an entry point into the economy, but it kind of means that a liberal arts education is something that almost it compounds interest in quite an interesting way. Where you know, after you spend some time at that entry point of liberal arts and technology, and you've proven yourself, then you can go in almost you know really any direction, and you and you have some some gravity, some, I don't know, a backlog of stuff that you've done. And now you're totally in that position where George Anders could go and do a bunch of different things. So how do you explore the the wave of options that you have in front of you? You know, when you could choose between writing books or just writing medium posts or tweet storms or, you know, you could, you could go, I don't know, pitch CNN on a show or something like... Well, how do you decide how to navigate this, This what for you is, I'm sure, plentiful uh, array of, of journalistic options that you could explore? So I'd say probably seven or eight months of the year, I'll just pick whatever looks interesting and new and exciting and fun. And I have a fairly high need for novelty in my professional life. I, so just trying something I haven't done before would, would be an experiment. And I did National Novel Writing Month one year and discovered that on the good side, I, I can bring a 50,000-word uh, novel to completion. And on the humbling side, I really shouldn't give up my day job because fiction isn't my calling. But I liked that book. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a much deeper appreciation of how novelists construct their work, though. 
And for that alone, it was worth the exercise because I realized that being true to your characters and driving your plot is sort of two gears that grind in different ways. And occasionally when I get to a bumpy section of someone's book, instead of going, oh, that doesn't feel quite right, I go, wow, they were trying to achieve a hairpin turn on one of those two dimensions. And the fact that they were able to do it as well as they did is pretty impressive, even allowing for the fact that there's a little bit of, you know, gear grinding and, you know, banging off the guardrail in the process. So I, I just actually like reading fiction more and I have a deeper appreciation of it. So that alone was worth it. That said, you got to make a living. And every now and then I will look and see where's a project that will make sure that we don't go broke. And I try and make it interesting. But one of the things I found is if that I write about large companies at inflection points, that tends to bring me speaking invitations. And mm-hmm. if I can share the same story for multiple audiences, then I've got room to over-invest in something else that's just fun and is going to take too long and won't pay very much, but is really interesting to do. So there's a, a bit of balancing between that. And I also find moving up and down the stack sort of helps me that uh, blog posts turn into books, books turn into blog posts. It doesn't always happen, but there's a, a synergy between ideas on big and small scales. And hmm. in fact, probably one of the reasons I've kept a foot in journalism is each time I finish up a book, there are all these interesting things that either didn't fit into the book or that are tucked away on page 117. And I go, you know what? That actually deserves a little bit of attention in its own right. And that tends to give me a few months of journalism to do afterward, or in some cases, even a few years. So if I were a more focused person, I would have locked in on one of these things. But then I might have also been the person who discovered that you know, the tide went out and whatever I was doing was no longer in demand. And the nice thing about having multiple platforms is there's always something that's working well and, in fact, working better than I expected. I just rotate a bit from area to area. Do you ever think about going into product strategy or investing? Oh, it's funny you ask. Uh, way back when I was working in London and I was doing a story about personality tests and I figured, oh, okay, I should go take a personality test and see what they make of my twisted soul And they were actually much more courteous than I'd expected. And they said, you know, you seem reasonably suited to journalism, although it's not a perfect fit. But what you really ought to be is an investment manager because you just match that profile stone cold perfect. And I thought that was kind of interesting, but particularly where I was working at the time at the Wall Street Journal, you really weren't supposed to trade stocks at all. And there were very compelling reasons for that because you're privy to a fair amount of gray zone and in some cases outright insider information. And Mm -hmm. if you trade that actively, you can and should go to jail. So I didn't trade for all the years I was at the journal, but then eventually I ended up in the midst of working on one book that had no market implications. And I thought, okay, this is the closest I'm ever going to be to having autonomy to go and put my investment ideas to work. And I had beginner's luck the first couple of months and I bought some SQM, which is the Chilean mining company that produces a lot of the lithium that goes into electric batteries. And that did very well. And I made some clever trade on Ford. And I realized that BP, after the um, deep water explosion, was probably going to get sued like crazy. And I bought some puts on that and that made money. And I go, wow, I am, I am just really good at this stuff. And I should have stopped then, but under the mistaken impression that you know, getting the coin to come up heads three times meant I was a really good coin flipper, I then proceeded to make like five or six trades that were just no good at all and oh. gave back essentially all of the winnings. And ever since then, I've left it in index funds. And the the one thing I will say, you know, that story aside is um, in journalism, you're, you've got accountability, your stories need to be right. But there's also the opportunity to have a handful of stories that didn't quite work out as well as you hoped, but to get another one that's really mm-hmm. defining and then to double down on your best work and for that to be accretive. And investing a, runs a crueler scorecard. I mean, if you're wrong, you're just plain wrong and you lost money and you really don't get a chance to get it back. Mm. And if you're right, by the time you realize more broadly that we're right, you have to buy more at a higher price. And there isn't the equivalent in journalism of moving into a new field and becoming known as someone who's got a lot to contribute and you you get dividends on your earlier work. So my hat's off to people who invest well, I think, despite whatever that personality test said. Uh, the, the investment world has not suffered from my absence. I, it's it's a neat area to explore, but I, I don't think that was meant to be my calling. Ah, 
Well, or you were just at the beginning of building your calluses, but you realized how painful it was going to be to get those get those calluses built. Um, I, I, mean, I like that explanation. That's face saving and still keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, look. I, well, I'm saying this is so. I, you know, I, I think we've talked about this, but like I used to play poker, and like you know, I won a bunch of money, and then I lost a bunch of money, and it sucked. Like it was really, really painful, and it took me years to recover from that psychologically fully. But now I'm, you know, and now I really enjoy kind of the the risk elements of of a business, or at least the ideas of that. And that's, you know, kind of why I'm why I'm trying to position myself to to build a software business. But I don't know. I, I actually I, I still do feel the the day to day fluctuations in mood. Uh, and it's I guess my calluses still aren't aren't completely built. But I, I you know I don't blame anybody that doesn't want to go through that process because it's it definitely can impact like your just your mood and your relationships and there's there's a lot of advantages to avoiding that game altogether well said yeah uh, it's uh the the joy of being right is sometimes dwarfed by the frustration and the embarrassment of being wrong and, uh, yeah and it's uh, yeah and congratulations on the, the business too it's it's exciting to see what you're building yeah, well, thank you. Well, and, and so I mean, the thing is, like, maybe, and I'm just just speculating here, and we'll we'll close off shortly. But like, you know, I bet if you went to, you know, that that's the advantage of like going to um to like a venture fund or something. You know, you can you it's OPM, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're always winning. And sometimes you're winning yeah, on the yeah. carry. Sometimes you're winning on you know the fees. Sometimes you're winning another way. But yeah. there's. <laughs> But you're never really losing, and and you know that you're you can still speculate. Uh, you can you have the you have the speculative freedom of a journalist, uh, and your you know your downside is protected. But anyway, I'm sure you've considered that. Anyway, for now, I'm sure you're you're probably influencing more people positively by writing this book. So, uh, anyway, George, it's been a pleasure talking to you as always. Uh, you can do anything. The surprising power of a useless quote liberal arts education is your new book, and I recommend people go and check it out. Terrific. Thanks so much for being, giving me a chance to do this. Absolutely. Thank you, George. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash SE Daily. That's S Y M. P-H-O-N-O dot com slash S-E daily. Thanks to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow! 